to week six lectures on Jane Eyre. In today's session, I'm going to continue the plot of the novel and also discuss the concept of Imperial Gothic in relation to Jane Eyre. Jane is uh, taken in by people she later discovers are her cousins. One of them is St. John, a principal clergyman. He gives her a job and soon proposes marriage, suggesting that she join him as a missionary in India. Jane initially agrees to leave with him, but not as his wife. So I'm continuing from uh, the uh, plot that we uh, left off uh, in the previous session. Uh, if you remember, we uh, saw how Jane uh, leaves Thornfield Hall because she uh, realizes that uh, Rochester is already married uh, to Bertha Mason. And when he encourages her uh, to elope with him to France, she refuses and quits um, Thornfield Hall and she wanders around almost uh, destitute and uh, her status is not uh, much different from that of a beggar at that point in the novel and she is taken in by um, her relatives and she uh, gets a job uh, with them and one of them who is called St. John is a clergyman and he uh, offers marriage and um, travel to India to uh, carry out missionary work in the colony. Jane agrees to uh, leave for India but not as his uh, wife. However, St. John pressures her to reconsider his proposal and a wavering Jane finally appeals to heaven to show her what to do. Just then, she hears a mesmeric call from Rochester. Jane returns to Thornfield to find the estate burnt, set on fire by Rochester's wife, who then jumped to her death. Rochester, in an attempt to save her, was blinded. Reunited, Jane and Rochester marry. Rochester later regains some of his sight, and the couple have a son. When St. John is um, giving her uh, further encouragement to reconsider his marriage proposal. Jane is at a loss as to what is the right thing to do. Uh, she appeals to heaven and in a kind of telepathic communication, she uh, hears from Rochester who begs her to uh, return, uh, placing a lot of faith in that um, call in that mesmeric telepathic call uh, Jane returns to Thornfield to find it burnt down uh, she is um, told that it was set on fire by Bertha Mason who also jumped to her death she sort of flings herself from the top of the mansion and Rochester um, was injured uh, while he was attempting to save her uh, in fact, Rochester loses his sight in that accident and um, soon after uh, Jane and Rochester reconcile, they uh, get married and they live in uh, Fern Dean, which is a much smaller uh, house um, close to Thornfield Hall. Uh, we also are told that Rochester uh, later regains some of his uh, eyesight and that the couple have a son. The book was originally published in three volumes as Jane Eyre, an autobiography with Cara Bell listed as the editor. The lowered section of the novel was widely believed to be inspired by Charlotte Bronte's own life and the work was an immediate success. Um, Three interesting things uh, with regard to uh, the reception of uh, this novel. Firstly, uh, it was published as an autobiography. It was claimed to be uh, a fact rather than fiction. Secondly, um, 
as we have uh, discussed in the previous uh, lecture, we um, know that the lower section of the novel was inspired, was drawn on uh, the experiences that Charlotte Bronte had in the clergyman's uh, daughter's school and uh, the work was a bestseller. It immediately appealed to the reading public. Uh, the autobiography is uh, an interesting uh, way to describe uh, this novel. Uh, we are also reminded uh, of the fact that um, much of the Gothic fiction uh, are also uh, offered as uh, real life experiences which are written down by an editor uh, or by uh, a, a person who is recording that particular life and offering it to the public as a, a cautionary tale. Um, so in that fashion we have uh, Jane Eyre uh, offered to uh, the British reading public as the collection of um, the life experiences of a woman called Jane Eyre. Um, and Cara Bell being uh, referred to as, as the editor is very interesting because um, that kind of editorial work is also performed in relation to Gothic fiction where the editor collects all these narratives and packages it in an appropriate format and offers it to uh, the world to be read and uh, to be cautioned. So that's the case with um, Gothic fiction usually. Uh, in, in this case, Jane Eyre, Carabelle becomes an editor who uh, chooses the experiences of Jane Eyre and uh, gives it to the reading public so that they can learn from that life. Um, so it's an interesting uh, concept. There seems to be a contradiction in the title um, in relation to um, the absent author figure. If Jane Eyre is an autobiography, uh, then the author of that autobiography should be Jane Eyre. Um, however, that reference to the author is suppressed. Instead, we have an editor called Cara Bell so the editor is not necessarily um, the author, uh, of course, Cara Bell um, could be the pseudonym of Jane Eyre, but that uh, reference to the author is um, shielded here uh, for uh, cultural reasons. Uh, we know that uh, writing was not a respectable position for uh, middle class women and Charlotte Bronte along with her sisters used pseudonyms um, when they published their work. Uh, Wuthering Heights was uh, written by um, Alice Bell uh, whom we know to be uh, Emily Bronte and uh, Anne uh, Bronte wrote under the new, uh, pseudonym Acton Bell. So there is a, a, a lacuna or a deliberate attempt at confusion with regard to the reference to the author. So that is an interesting uh, uh, aspect and it connects with uh, the previous um, novel that we have uh, read uh, for this course which is um, Frankenstein, where once again, we do not have the name of the author mentioned on the title page. Jane Eyre's appeal was partly due to the fact that it was uh, written in the first person and often addressed the reader, creating great immediacy. In addition, Jane is an unconventional heroine an independent, self-reliant woman who overcomes both adversity and societal norms. One of the reasons that uh, Jane Eyre was a big hit with the readers is um, due to the fact that it was written in the first person narrative and the narrator addresses 
the reader uh, several times over the course of the novel, thus creating a bond with the reader. There's also a great sense of immediacy. The reader is invited to uh, look closely into the life of Jane Eyre. Further, uh, Jane Eyre was a success with the reading public also because uh, she was an extraordinary heroine in the sense that she was from the ordinary walks of life. She was from the middle class. She was a plain heroine. Uh, she was not a great beauty. She was very small and very plain. In fact, plainness was uh, emphasized to a great extent in the novel. And she was independent and very proud of her context. Um, she was also um, resourceful. She relied on her uh, personal courage and resilience to overcome very difficult circumstances and the regulations of society that usually bound women to their place. The novel also notably blended diverse genres. Jane's choice between sexual need and ethical duty belongs very firmly to the mode of moral realism. However, her close escape from a bigamous marriage and the fiery death of Bertha are part of the Gothic tradition. Jane Eyre falls within several subcategories of the novel. One can argue that this novel belongs to moral realism because Jane is given that difficult choice of whether to follow her sexual need, the desire to be with Rochester, or to do the right thing, to do her duty, be ethical by refusing uh, to live in sin, quote unquote, by running away with Rochester and uh, leading a life in uh, France as man and wife. The novel can also very firmly be anchored in the Gothic tradition because we have uh, the potential bigamous plot in terms of Rochester. Rochester is already married to Bertha Mason, but he's also about to marry Jane Eyre, to whom he suppresses his previous marriage. We also have uh, the very violent death of Bertha, who is killed during that fire accident that she uh, causes in Thornfield Hall. So these elements anchor this novel very, very strongly within the Gothic tradition. Now let's discuss the idea of Imperial Gothic. Imperial Gothic elements include wild, remote and often desolate landscapes, a vulnerable heroine, victimized by fear and manipulation, often by illegitimate or marginal family members, and an array of the supernatural, interspersing the plot with ghosts, dreams, and eerie voices. There's also a perceivable threat of the other, as in stark opposition to the West. So these information pertains to the attributes of the imperial gothic. One can very cl clearly see that the attributes belong to the generally understood uh, notion of the gothic mood as well. Both the imperial gothic and the um, gothic include wild, remote, desolate uh, settings, a persecuted heroine, reference to the supernatural. But in the Imperial Gothic, very specifically, there is a threat of the other. There is a threat from the foreign. Um, there is a threat to the home, to the West, to uh, Britain, um, from the exotic, strange, unknown foreign other. So that element of the other, which comes in relation to usually British colonies creates this uh, category of the Imperial Gothic. 
we do have the other from the colony in Jane Eyre in relation to Bertha Mason. And we also have eerie sounds, again, in the context of Bertha uh, Mason, uh, the sounds which persecute, which threaten uh, Jane Eyre when she is um, staying in the mansion. In Jane Eyre, uh, dark mahogany furniture and crimson decorations take precedent, adding another layer to the haunting qualities of the story as it echoes the colonial death and destruction that made this furniture possible. There is um, the suggestion that Bertha Mason stands in for the destroyed colony, uh, the rich furniture that litters, that decorates uh, Thornfield Hall comes from the plunder of a colony. Uh, and that kind of context gives evocation to the notion of imperial uh, gothic. The dark furniture and the crimson um, furnishings, decorations, emphasize the haunting element of the story. It also simultaneously reinforces very subtly the nature of destruction suffered by a colony uh, at the hands of colonial masters. So one can see how Jane Eyre is connected to this particular thematic of Imperial Gothic when one studies the character of Bertha Mason and the source of wealth that furnishes the interiors of Thornfield Hall. Jane Eyre's romance with Mr. Rochester begins on a gloomy English night when she glances upon his dark, stern face for the first time. Rochester seems unreachable and distant despite his initial intimacy with Jane. So what I'm trying to do in this section of this lecture is to pick up on the Gothic moments the Gothic moments which uh, underline this novel, as well as the Gothic moments which connected to the notion of the imperial Gothic. Jane meets Mr. Rochester on a very dark, um, cold night, and when Rochester sees her, he at first thinks of her as a spirit, uh, as, a, as a supernatural being. Fortunately, for Rochester, she comes to his aid when his horse falls and slips. And that moment is, is a dark, threatening moment in the novel. And later on, Jane realizes that Rochester is the master of Thornfield Hall, a place where she is going to work as a governess. Though Jane experiences friendliness initially with Rochester. She senses a drawing, a, a, a strangeness, an estrangement from him very soon. So that thawing of affections uh, creates the seesaw of emotions that Jane finds very hard to come to terms with. And one is led to believe that he is a man of mystery. There are things hidden in his life and that temperamental nature of Rochester is also a gothic subtext. It's very hard to trust him and at the same time not come within um, his charm. Rochester is very, very charming. He has an exaggerated way of speaking. He cracks jokes. He tries to be on equal footing. So these are some of the aspects that create an element of indeterminacy and uncertainty uh, that keeps Jane off her uh, balance most of the time at Thornfield Hall. 
Mrs. Fairfax welcomes Jane into Rochester's mansion and she is immediately taken aback by the wildness and remoteness of Thornfield. Jane's innocent character feels out of place at this manor home as she also immediately feels threatened by her surroundings in the dark, mysterious environment. What is emphasized at this point here is that Thornfield Hall is very remote, very wild, and it is dark and mysterious. So this setting is a classic Gothic setting. We have seen in the previous lectures on the Gothic trope that remoteness is an important element of the Gothic. So by being remote, this setting, this domestic hearth, this particular castle-like mansion is far away from the civilizational aspects of society and we are also led to believe that perhaps Jane's innocence, Jane's uh, personal um, safety is a threat within this isolated, much removed uh, hall and the element of mystery is also a hook for the reader to keep reading. So the gothic thrill is also encoded at the very beginning of the novel. The readers are encouraged to read for a solution, to read for greater clarity into the nature of the master, Rochester. Is he an evil man or is he a man who would marry uh, Jane? So that question that thrilling question is what keeps the reader uh, reading. Further, the setting and the nature of the master takes this novel closer to the Gothic mood. We are asked very unsure whether he is going to be a villain who will harass Jane or one who would rescue her from the clutches of an evil villain. Jane's initial entrance into Rochester's mansion emphasizes the darkness of the imperial gothic as it instills fear in the female protagonist and puts an ominous and other in reference to the colonial gothic and the perceived danger of savages and anything non-British danger into her life which in turn twists her own narrative throughout the novel. Here we find the initial spark of imperial gothic romance which with the injection of Rochester's own dark path will threaten Jane's British goodness and purity. There are several ways to make sense of this particular critique. There are also different ways to, to kind of read meanings into the novel in relation to this particular critique. This novel has an aura of the imperial gothic undoubtedly and that comes uh, through the figure of Bertha Mason. One can also see Thornfield Hall itself as an other, a strange space into which the homely, innocent Jane Eyre enters at her own peril and from which she is uh, safely and securely removed and everything is resolved ultimately for the benefit of Jane and her beloved and the hall is destroyed. That's one way of looking at the novel. Further, one can look at the novel as offering a space for Thornfield Hall as a symbolic colony where savages such as Bertha Mason live and when Jane enters that strange bizarre space she comes within contact of that savage who is potential 
who is potentially going to harm Jane Eyre. So what is clear to us is that the home space and the other speciality comes in conflict within the hall called Thornfield. Rochester, by his association with Bertha Mason, gets elements of the savage into his own personality and he endangers Jane's British goodness and purity by trying to seek an alliance with Jane while he's already married to the other. So one can very clearly see the different hermeneutics one can elicit by the various intersecting narratives and their thematic implications. What is very clear to us is that the other becomes threatening, the other becomes ominous, and by close association with the other, the figure who belongs to whom also gets stained in some fashion and becomes a threat to the home. Rochester's marriage to Bertha Mason is an instance of the imperial gothic romance gone bad. So that romance have to be cut off and eliminated before Rochester could be recovered by the home and Jane becomes an instrument of recovery. Her goodness, her purity rescues Rochester from his evil destructive path and brings him back home to offer Salas and, and convert him to the good side. So these are some of the implications that one can read into the relationship between Rochester, Bertha and Jane Eyre. It is in this context that it seems appropriate for Thornfield Hall to burn down Thornfield Hall that became enriched with colonial plunder. Thornfield, which had, in a strange way, a colonial woman as its mistress, burns down, destroying both the mistress and the wealth of the hall, seems to be the perfect solution for the novel in order to reject the figure of the colonial woman. With her absence, Nothing is problematic to bring in Jane Eyre, the homegrown, the woman from the middle class, to occupy the space which was emptied by the colonial mad woman Bertha Mason. Now, two decades before Bronte published Jane Eyre in 1847, the tales of William Burke and William Hare ominously crept over Britain. At the same time, the gothic genre was gaining popularity with an audience that could not get enough of these thrilling, haunting stories. So what I am trying to suggest uh, by this detail is that there was a market for gothic narratives, um, both in fiction and from real life. So who are these characters, William Burke and William Hare, and why were they popular? The duo, Burke and Hare, grave robbed churches in the United Kingdom for corpses. They dug up bodies and sold them on the black market as cadavers for medical students, which in turn created the demand for iron bars over grave sites. During a time in the United Kingdom of chilling murder stories and grave robberies, it's no wonder that novels such as Jane Eyre gained popularity as a means to convey Gothic imperialism and the lingering other.
so these two figures, Burke and Hare, were grave robbers. Uh, we saw similar references when we read um, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. Uh, we noted how graves were robbed and how that connected with um, the creation of the monster by uh, Frankenstein. What is interesting to us uh, in these contexts is the fact that uh, while cadavers were useful black market objects, stories about them was also very, very popular among the readers. Anything gothic, anything out of the ordinary, anything thrilling, uh, anything threatening, anything dark had a, a market in the publishing scenario and at that time Jane Eyre was published and it exploited that eagerness for dark material which were consumed by the audience the reading audience and Jane Eyre was not just any simple uh, bizarre narrative that fed the need for dark stories among the readers. Dark Jane Eyre was used to convey the very important concept of Gothic imperialism and it was useful to invest the creation of a set of attributes about the other. It was useful to create in the culture, in the British market, in the British mind, a set of attributes about the other, the foreign, the strange, and the bizarre. Thank you for watching. I'll continue in the next session.